that's that's Julian Schnabel's place yeah. or something. Someone had told us that place we were shopping. And yeah, it's kind of odd. <laughs> I don't know it before, so I don't know, you know, how people in the neighborhood feel about it. But you know, change is hard always. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of out of place, certainly with the color of this building and everything. Maybe I'll paint it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it was uh, during this uh, very long community campaign that was going on to try to get the Far West Village, which is the western edge of Greenwich Village, um, landmarked and to get it down zoned, which means to um, change the zoning so that the size and scale of new development would be lower and more in keeping with what's currently there. And this was a very, very public campaign. It had been going on for quite some time and we were making some good progress with the city. We got some preliminary commitments that they would consider it. And then we discovered that Mr. Schnabel had actually filed to get permits from the city for what was eventually built, which was to uh, add, I think it's about um, 120 feet worth of building on top of his existing turn of the century three-story stable. And he went about doing it in a way that was particularly unsettling because he had an existing permit to add, I think, something like two or three stories to the building. And then he asked the Department of Buildings, instead of having to file a new permit, which would take longer, would be more complicated, there would be more reviews, um, he asked the Department of Buildings to take the permit that he had, which was 10 years old. So it was basically for something he thought of doing 10 years ago, never actually did, but never allowed the permit to expire. Um, and he asked for something called a post-approval amendment which means after you've already gotten approval for something, you're asking for a change in it. And what he asked for was to change what was a permit for a two or three story addition to turn it into a 12 story building, which as far as we and many others were concerned is not something that should have been allowed in that manner. It should have been considered a completely new application. And so we were both um, disconcerted that he was seeking this shortcut approval and that the city would consider giving it to him. And in fact, they did um, over our great protests, you know, us and many of the other neighbors. Um, and so, you know, throughout the process, though, we made many attempts to get in touch with Mr. Schnabel, to reach out to him as a neighbor, as a member of the community, to talk about what he was planning, to talk about what we were trying to do, to see how we could work together. He never responded. And typically, if we reached out to him to say, look, we know you're considering doing X, we have these concerns, we'd love to talk to you about it, what he would do is not respond and then expedite his work to get what he was trying to do, done, done as quickly as possible and not talk to us in any way about what he was considering doing. So it was a very, um, uh, you know, I have to say it was a very um, unpleasant, um, frustrating experience, especially with somebody who, um, you know, many of his neighbors had considered um, you know, kind of a part of the community. He'd done a very nice job of keeping up this, you know, very nice sort of semi-industrial turn of the century stable. Um, you know, people considered him part of the community and then he was kind of turning, turning around and really thumbing his nose at us. Um, and I think people would have felt one way about it if what he was doing was because you know, he needed to expand his studio or expand his home. This was a purely 100% money-making real estate venture. He wanted to add, um, you know, it was basically the equivalent of 11 or 12 floors of luxury condos on top of his little turn-of-the-century stable for sale to make money. Uh, David Hockney said you should live on the ugliest building on the block so you, you don't have to look at it when you look out your window. Never. He never responded. We hand delivered letters and notes to um, to the site. Um, we uh, tried to reach him by phone. Um, we never got any response from him, or even so much as an assistant or you know somebody who worked for him. 
or anything like that. And you know what I just described in terms of the initial contact was actually just sort of the early stage. There were many more things that happened after that. And it was interesting because when there would be negative publicity about what was going on, including when he was accused by literally dozens of his neighbors, independently of one another, of doing illegal work in an attempt to try to get around the impending rezoning so that he could build this extra tall building as opposed to conforming to the new contextual downzoning that was being implemented. Um, he was lightning fast at getting on the phone to the press when he was getting negative media attention for what was going on, but when his neighbors tried to reach out to him or when we tried to reach out to him, there was no response whatsoever. So at first I thought, you know, maybe the guy's kind of reclusive, really insulated, maybe he's not even there most of the time and doesn't even know what's going on. But, um, uh, you know, the fact is, is that when uh, he was getting bad press, he was, incredibly able to get on the phone and get in touch with who he wanted to reach to try to deflect the negative media attention he was getting, but he couldn't be bothered to do the same for his neighbors or for community groups that were trying to reach out to him. I like it. You like it? Yeah. Basically the issue of the height and the fact that we were trying to get the neighborhood landmarked and we thought that this, um, you know, stable building um, from the turn of the century, arts and crafts style, um, was part of the fabric of the neighborhood. It was right next door to an 1840s row house that's in pretty pristine condition, which has actually since been landmarked. Um, and so, you know, Ideally, we would have liked to have seen the building remain as it is, or something probably more similar to what his original plans were, which were for a modest addition on top, um, I think we all could have lived with. It was the notion of kind of um, uh, inserting uh, this, basically the equivalent of an 11 or 12 story building on top of it, um, that we were very put off by. Um, it seemed like it would be extremely, um, inconsistent with the building itself, with the surrounding buildings, with the, um, the Far West Village in general, which we were trying very hard to um, preserve. So, you know, and I think a lot of people were also just not thrilled by the notion of, you know, more and more um, super luxury condo towers that would be second, third, fourth, fifth homes for jet setters um, in the neighborhood. And it's amazing how much the neighborhood has changed in the last five years since this effort started when the notion of a tower of that scale, a building that, you know, sort of served that purpose in terms of being this, you know, sort of fourth or fifth home for, you know, the ultra rich was very new and different. In the last five years, it's become uh, shockingly commonplace um, in that area, but at the time it was a radical departure from the character of the neighborhood that people were very much did not want to see happen. So the size and scale and sort of preserving the character of the neighborhood was really what our original concern was. Um, I will say that personally when I saw the building uh, and its design revealed once it did go up I was personally not a big fan of the style itself. And, you know, that's subjective, and I respect other people who feel differently. I know people who think it's the ugliest building they've ever seen. I know people who think it's the most beautiful building they've ever seen. And I know people who think everything in between. Um, you know, and, and that's fine. I have a little trouble seeing too much of the beauty uh, in it. I heard someone once describe it as kind of a, it looks like a Malibu Barbie uh, house that exploded, um, and I can kind of see where that description comes from. Um, but, you know, I think those subjective issues people can debate about, but um, I think what's fairly objectively true is that um, the neighborhood was successful in getting a rezoning in place that was supposed to preserve and protect the character, which would have allowed him to still add a modest addition, and according to literally dozens of his neighbors, he... Um, had his workers illegally do work early in the morning and after hours in order to rush to get his foundations in place 
before the rezoning took effect so that he could then argue to the city, hey, I should be exempted from the rezoning because my foundations have already been built. So people should just know it's not that the building was built before the rezoning took effect. The building had not even begun when the rezoning took effect, but literally in the two and a half or three weeks before the rezoning took effect, according to people who live on that block, his workers were in there hours and hours before and after you are legally allowed to do work trying to get those concrete foundations in place so that he could then say to the city you have to exempt me from these new rules because i already have my foundations in the ground and unfortunately he was successfully able to make that argument and the really frustrating thing um, and the ironic thing was so all of these neighbors said they witnessed uh, the illegal work going on, and they reported it to 311, which is the system through which you're supposed to report illegal work. The city did not respond to a single one of those complaints in less than, I think it was something like uh, a week, and some of them they didn't respond until a month later, long after the rezoning was, was in place, long after the all of the controversy was over and done with, some of the complaints they never responded to. And so the city said, and this is the catch-22 element of it, well, we never witnessed the illegal work, so we cannot prevent him from getting the exemption from the zoning. We have to say his foundation is in place, so he gets the exemption, even though all of these people complained about it being done illegally, and even though we never responded to those complaints to check them out, he gets the, he gets the get out of jail free card, so to speak, regardless. And so that was particularly frustrating, and I think to a lot of people, it felt like there was a sort of a fix that was in, that from very early on, you know, he got these expedited building permits in a very unorthodox manner. Um, he was able to do what neighbors said was illegal work for days on end, and every complaint to the city about it went unanswered. And then the city said, well, because he did the work and because we ourselves never witnessed it being done illegally, we have to give him this exemption to these new rules that will apply to everybody else. So basically, anyone else on that block can now not build what he built, um, but he was able to get away with it because of, again, what neighbors say was illegal work that was done in order to slip it in under the deadline. I think it is such a, Julia Snabel did such an awful work there. This is, you it's know. It's good to hear because everyone loves it. No, no, it's not my favorite cup of tea. Which one, this building? Yeah. yeah. Do, do you live in the neighborhood? Yeah, right here. This is too pretentious. Do not belong to to the neighborhood, and, and it's such a bad job. This is not the color is telling, not in European way, because it doesn't even look old. It's too made. It. Julian, you should do a better job. But I love his work. Uh, you know, I can only speculate. Um, I would venture to guess that he's probably very well connected. Um, he probably has a lot of friends who may have been able to be helpful to him. And, you know, I would say that in general, the city's record on this sort of thing is spotty at best. Um, you know, we all, the Department of Buildings in New York City is notorious um, for its corruption, for its um, lack of ability to enforce its own rules for its ignoring issues of public safety. So, you know, some of it may have simply been that he was just able to work a broken system um, without any special favors whatsoever. It may also, however, be that he was able to make some phone calls or had some friends who were able to be helpful to him. It's only speculation, I don't know, but it's very, very clear that the normal rules um, did not seem to apply here, and that the law was not, um, uh, did not seem to be um, enforced for him the way other people in the neighborhood um, have been told, this is the law and you have to obey it. Can I ask you what you think of the building across the street? 
the palazzo? Um, it's, I don't know, it sort of disrupts. Um, it doesn't feel like the whole feel of the Greenwich Village, but um, I don't know, I, I sort of ignore it. I don't really care about it, so. Do you manage to ignore it? What? Can you really ignore it? Because it's very present. Well, I, I just manage, I just look away, I mean. It's sort of like those black buildings down there, how they're just changing Greenwich Village. But, I don't know, I don't really think it's that nice, and I don't think it's something that will make Greenwich Village better. Well, I mean, certainly the trend now is that the area seems to be becoming more and more um, expensive and exclusive and, um, you know, desirable. Um, and, you know, obviously that's a trend that's been going on for a long time. I think it's hard to read too far into the future because so much of that sort of stuff, it seems to me, is about um, what's fashionable, what's trendy, um, and you don't know five or ten years down the road what will be fashionable or what will be trendy. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, the, the big, um, for instance, the big sort of like uh, glass, uh, glass walled sort of fishbowl um, luxury towers like the Meyer Towers just down the block are going to be looked at in the very near future as this sort of early 21st century cliche, um, which may well be extremely unfashionable in the not too distant future. I don't know. Um, you know, they may be the, um, you know, sort of the classic pre-wars of the future. Um, where everybody wants one because nobody makes them like that anymore. Um, I, you know, I think it's very hard to say. We have been able to get um, s increased um, zoning restrictions and increased landmark protections in the neighborhood that at least means that we should see much, uh, many, many fewer cases of the historic buildings of the neighborhood being knocked down, many fewer cases of new developments going up, I think that will help in terms of um, keeping the neighborhood's character physically, um, but the neighborhood is going to continue to evolve in a lot of different ways, whether it's what we're currently seeing in terms of you know, more and more wealthy folks moving in and moving in oftentimes because you know, this is one of many homes that they own. Um, I think you know, you're seeing um, the sort of nightlife almost carnival-like atmosphere of the meatpacking district to the north beginning to extend to the south. Um, it's very hard to say what effect that might have on things. Um, you are seeing, uh, you're beginning to see the proliferation of hotels in the area, which also may have a big impact. You know, and many people worry that a lot of these trends could have a, end up ultimately having a negative impact in terms of the desirability of the area or in terms of who actually wants to live there. So, um, you know, it's hard to say. We and other people in other groups are definitely doing a lot of different things to try to get the city to pay attention to some of these problems um, and to um, work on ensuring that the future of the Far West Village is at least somewhat consistent with its past physically and in terms of it being a community where people live um, that's at least somewhat accessible to um, uh, people beyond just the super rich. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd be lying if I could say I knew for sure really how that was going to turn out in the coming years. I think it's beautiful. I actually got a tour of the building. Did you? Yeah. How did you do that? Uh, my friend Brian Kelly has, works there. Okay. Or he works for Julian. So how is it inside? Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Beautiful. I it's amazing, every detail. We're probably stuck with it, for better or worse. Uh, you know, and like I said, I recognize that there are people who uh, find it, you know, sort of quixotic um, and appealing in that way, and other people who I think will um, always hate it, whether because they know um, how it ended up getting built or because they just don't like the way that it looks. Um, you know, it's there. Uh, whether or not it's going to continue to command the sort of super high prices that Mr. Schnabel is asking for it, or whether or not it will be looked at as sort of a, you know, kind of a weird, strange, um, sad um, anomaly uh, in the neighborhood in the coming years, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's very, very hard to predict that sort of stuff. 
Um, I do know that you're not going to see any more towers like that built on that block because um, the zoning doesn't allow it. And I think it's, it's a little unfortunate that there's this sort of one exemption that this sort of wealthy, famous, well-connected um, artist slash developer um, was able to get. Um, uh, but, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, sort of people talk a lot about how there's become such an intersection of art and commerce and how the two have become um, almost impossible to differentiate from one another. And I think this is a, a perfect example of that in some ways. I mean, the guy basically became a real estate developer, um, but he's been sort of selling his product um, using his name as an artist and as a filmmaker. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll see. That's obviously his right. Uh, you know, he's creating his legacy. Um, and it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's his choice to do. Um, I'm glad that because of the success that we've had with the other changes uh, that we've been able to implement in the neighborhood that we're not going to see too many more of those happening. Well, I think that it's, it's of interest that Julian Schnabel, I'm just standing on this side, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting, he's a painter, and uh, he made this building that looks like it's out of Spain or Madrid. It's so out of context here, in, in like, in West Beth, way in the, you know, the West. It's, it's a great idea. I mean, I must say he's very imaginative. To, to, to have the idea to put that in there, and only somebody with money would be able to do that. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised that they're allowed to do that without the, uh, like down the block, there's like these towers, right? Repeat of the World Trade Center, you know? I mean, they look all glass and everything. So it's, it's very interesting that you did that. It's, it's very, it's, I, I give him high accolades, so I attribute to him to do this. Um, I, I, although I do say that he should open that as an artist community, just like West Beth, for artists. I mean, if I had the money, I would say, you know what? Let artists like move in there. A low income. So I think it's a beautiful structure. I love the color that he did. This like strawberry, this kind of like beautiful like. Uh, Whatever the color is, it's, it's, it's kind of quite, quite beautiful. I give him high accolades. He's a, he's a, the Basquiat movie. You know, what can you? I mean, what can I say? I don't know. Should I say something else? If I were the moon, I would go in and out of your eyes, but I was only a man to go in and out of your flesh. Seven leaves unfold the seeds where only holy runes proceed. Dennis Golden.